Good evening, everyone. Uh, today is Monday, October the 26th, uh, 2020. And I want to uh, welcome you all to Pandemic in Historical Perspective. My name is Matthew Smith. I'm the director of the Michael J. Colligan History Project. And tonight's online panel discussion uh, features historical experts and leaders from the fields of local government and culture and the arts. Um, but before we begin, I just want to say a, a quick word of acknowledgement to the hosts of tonight's event. The Colligan History Project is a joint undertaking of uh, Miami University's Hamilton campus and the Hamilton Community Foundation. So I want to just say a special word of thanks to the Michael J. Colligan Committee of the Hamilton Community Foundation here in Hamilton, Ohio, for their continuing support uh, for public programming um, and uh, also to the Miami University's Menard Center for Family Democracy. Um, and I, I want to thank them for including us in this season's uh, Dialogues on Democracy series. So this evening's goal is to share insights and understanding on pandemics in American life. We have five panelists tonight. Um, each one is going to give a short five minute presentation. And then when we've gone around the room, uh, the floor is going to be opened up for Q&A. So if you can see the Q&A box, um, this will be your opportunity to speak uh, to the panelists directly after the, uh, the short presentations. So without further ado, I want to introduce um, the first of our five panelists this evening. This is Dr. Jim Harrison. Uh, sorry, Dr. Jim Harris, a uh, historian of modern Europe and the history of science, medicine, and the environment. Uh, Dr. Harris received his PhD in 2017 uh, from and currently lectures at the, the Ohio State University. His research focuses on public health campaigns in urban Britain at the turn of the 20th century. He's published on other aspects of the history of science, especially infectious diseases, the history of human sciences, and on the First World War. I also want to point out that his article, Pandemics Today and Yesterday, published by o o OSU's Origins, Current Events, and Historical Perspective, um, was the recent winner of the Stanton Foundation Pl Prize for Applying History to Clarify the uh, COVID-19. So uh, our first panelist today is Dr. Jim Harris. Thanks very much, Jim. Thank you for having me and good evening, everybody. I'm going to share my screen here real fast with you all. If I can. Uh, this evening, I have been asked to speak with you all broadly about uh, pandemics in in human history and specifically to introduce you to the 1918 influenza pandemic that we're hearing so much about um, in light of current events. But I think it's a good place to start by just thinking about current events. And the tragedy is that cases of COVID-19 in the United States are rapidly on the rise and the same holds true um, here in Ohio as well. This current uh, public health crisis is not the first pandemic in human history. Obviously, actually, there's a quite long and deep history of pandemics in human history through our recorded history. These microbes have lived with us, evolved with us, and had profound impacts on our society um, and significant uh, mortality in some cases. My goal for this evening is to uh, draw some lessons from uh, a, re a recent, well, re recent in the grand scheme of human history, as we see here, case, and that, that is the 1918 influenza. It's one of what I think are the four uh, biggest pandemics in human history, which I'm happy to answer questions about in the Q&A. <clears throat> you probably heard of this um, this this particular influenza pandemic called the Spanish flu. Um, there's absolutely nothing Spanish about it. Uh, it that name derives from the fact that uh, Spain was neutral uh, during the First World War. So reports of the pandemic um, early on emerged out of Spain. And so it was given this 
uh, misnomer. Another uh, interesting uh, potential misnomer for it to frame our thinking tonight is, is the title of Alfred Crosby's book, one of the earliest studies of the subject, America's Forgotten Pandemic. And hopefully uh, by the time we're done here this evening, that will no longer be true for all of you this evening. I um, often tell my students and uh, uh, colleagues and, and when I speak to the public, uh, it's really important to think about the 1918 flu within the context of the First World War. Uh, and this quote from the Journal of the American Medical Association um, really establishes uh, this wartime context. It, it reminds us that medical science was so focused on, on battlefield medicine that it faced a, a double whammy of, of significant challenges from the war, followed by this devastating uh, outbreak of influenza which probably, uh, and these are relatively conservative numbers, uh, contributed about 500 million cases uh, around the world and about 50 million deaths, including 675,000 here in the United States in a uh, rate of mortality far, far worse than the um, typ a typical flu pandemic. It was also, uh, particularly problematic. A typical in a typical uh, influenza pandemic, um, mortality curves often uh, look like a U. The young, the very young, and the very old are the most afflicted uh, by a pan by a pandemic of influenza. Uh, but in the case of 1918, this middle spike in the age graph um, uh, compounded the pain of the First World War, creating this sort of W shaped mortality curve. You've probably seen this graph or something similar to it in the news, talking about the flu occurring over three waves, a, a summer wave in around uh, June of 1918, a second wave that occurs and was by far the most deadly in the fall, followed by a third wave in early 1919. This pandemic probably broke out uh, on a military base in Kansas, um, where the Camp Cook was possibly patient zero of the pandemic. And we can trace the geography of it around the world, uh, following the movement of troops uh, in particular. In the first uh, wave, if you will, of the 1918 flu, we can map it geographically, as you see here in this uh, map of the world. But then, in the late summer into the early fall, uh, the virus mutated, it became much more virulent, much more dangerous, and that's what causes that significant uptick in late 1918. And that second wave, we also can correlate with uh, the wartime experience because it first breaks out in three cities roughly simultaneously in late August of 1918, all of which were major ports for the movement of troops and goods across the Atlantic to fight in the last months of the First World War. And public health responses were similarly shaped by the wartime context. Uh, in my research, I work on Great Britain. Um, the response was basically nothing. The head of public health shown here on the left, Sir Arthur, Arthur Newsom, simply said to keep calm and carry on until after the war was over. Um, whereas the United States was more aggressive in responding. And so I'll, I'll end my remarks by just talking about a couple of those public health responses. And I think this will help lead us into the next panel as well. Um, this was a crisis. Uh, doctors and nurses were, uh, resources were spread far, far thin as the focus was again, keeping soldiers on the battlefield. Nurses were overwhelmed. The number of patients per nurse as this um, uh, quote uh, reminds us was considerable. Um, but we also have some important historical lessons uh, that we can learn from this pandemic. Though it was a, 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 a tragedy that cost many, many lives, um, basic public health mitigations were critical to controlling the spread of influenza. And they're the same mitigations we need to see and are seeing used uh, to combat COVID-19. Cloth masks, or gauze masks in 1918 were um, important for containing respiratory droplets in some cities and states, 
they were made legally uh, compulsory, elsewhere not so much. And the same quarantine measures, social distancing measures uh, that, that we're using to combat COVID-19 were also the key to bringing mortality down um, in the case of influenza in 1918. In places uh, uh, like if you see Philadelphia, that, that huge spike, uh, that's because they had a large scale parade um, to raise money for the war effort. Whereas places like where I'm at here in Columbus, Ohio, uh, social distancing quarantine measures were prolonged. And so the mortality curve was that much lower. So I'll stop there and i um, happy to answer any questions either about 1918 or pandemics in general during the Q&A. Thanks very much. Uh, that was uh, Dr. Jim Harris from The Ohio State University. Our next panelist is uh, Dr. Susan Spellman, uh, my colleague here at Miami University uh, regional campuses. Um, she is an associate professor of history and the author of Cornering the Market, Independent Grocers and Innovation in American Small Business, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2016. Um, she has also received the 2005 Russell B. Nye Award for Outstanding Article um, and uh, published in the Journal of Popular Culture uh, alongside the 2011 Franklin Jameson Fellowship from the American Historical Association and Library of Congress. Um, in addition, Dr. Spellman has held fellowships from Harvard Business School and the National Museum of American History, among others. So, um, Susan, uh, if you want to take it from here. Yes, thank you so much, Matthew. I really appreciate it. Uh, and I want to thank the Michael J. Culligan History Project and the Menard Family Center for Democracy uh, for inviting me to participate in this panel discussion. Uh, I'd also like to thank Dr. Smith for asking me to weigh in on the of the 1918 pandemic, uh, because it made me realize that despite spending many years uh, hanging out in 1918, as I like to, you know, kind of say, I was conducting research on the grocery trade. Um, however, I rarely encountered the pandemic and the historical record, and Matthew's inquiry made me really wonder why that was the case. And, you know, why hadn't I found widespread reports of store closures of, of toilet paper shortages? And indeed, they did have toilet paper back then and used it. Uh, uh, but there were, I didn't see reports really of, uh, to a great extent of whole business districts shutting down. And so Dr. Smith's inquiry about the business and economic effects of the pandemic in 1918 gave me the chance to go back to uh, that year and you know, around that time as well to find some answers. And clearly there's a connection to the current pandemic because there is a lot of concern about whether to shut down everything to save lives and to quell the, you know, the, the outbreaks or to remain open. And so in going back to 1918, what I discovered were um, a number of short and long-term fiscal effects as municipal and state commissions wrestled to balance public welfare with business and economic health. Uh, with no federal level store closing or masking mandates, the nation experienced a, a hodgepodge of non-pharmaceutical interventions that I think Dr. Harris have alluded to, uh, that in some places shut down shops, theaters, and saloons, uh, and other places limited business hours, or uh, simply asked store owners to forego bargain sales that might draw large crowds, uh, as was the case in Butte, Montana. Such mandates, however, were often difficult to enforce, uh, especially among small businesses, many of which um, had to keep their doors open and did so often to the detriment of their workers. Newspapers from the period uh, are filled with announcements of sick employees and business owners who had succumbed to the flu. Uh, one Shreveport, Louisiana businessman, though, urged his fellow traders to follow the city's restricted business hours and imploring them that, you know, the loss of a few dollars, he said, is nothing compared to the health of the people. Across the country, retail sales fell as people were either too sick or feared catching the flu by leaving their homes. Uh, according to one economic historian, estimated per capita consumption in the U.S. declined 8% 
making the 1918 pandemic the fourth costliest event of the 20th century. Uh, and it's bested only by the two world wars and the Great Depression. Those who ventured out frequently donned masks, particularly as holiday shoppers, uh, crowded department stores in places like Indianapolis, New York, and Fort Wayne. In Little Rock, Arkansas, though, some merchants experienced a 40% decline in business, uh, while others estimated a 70% downturn. Retail grocers, uh, my specialty, reported uh, in Little Rock a 33% drop off in trade. Uh, and one department store in that city witnessed a nearly 50% loss in daily receipts. Only Little Rock's pharmacies reported an uptick in business. Um, this, of course, is not an uncommon pattern. As nationwide, we see that um, drug, grocery, and liquor stores uh, experience smaller losses overall. Um, you know, the grocery trade is really recession and apparently pandemic proof as a, is our liquor stores. Uh, the manufacturing side of it, and this is um, a, a really wonderful, uh, you know, a cartoon from uh, Fort Wayne, you know, bemoaning the idea that the, the flu bug couldn't get through all those masks despite the crowds of holiday shoppers. On the manufacturing side, output was also decreased. Uh, and this is, again, largely from a lack of workers, many of whom, like shoppers, were either too sick or too scared to go out. Labor shortages brought about by the draft only compounded the difficulties. Coal mine production in places like Kentucky and West Virginia, for example, dropped 15%. Close quarters and poor underground ventilation in the mines only exacerbated the flu spread. In the mining town of Coldfield, Tennessee, for example, only 2% of its 500 residents were um, well at, at one point. So many lumbermen sick, mills in the south struggled to meet demand for pine and other woods used to make coffins, leaving cities like Philadelphia, again, that Dr. Harris alluded to. Um, there, the city morgue had 10 times as many bodies as coffins, and they struggled to cope uh, with the shortage of those uh, materials. By the time it was all over, though, estimated U.S. economic costs of the pandemic totaled $3 billion, which is approximately $250 billion in today's money. One positive, if slightly morbid, uh, morbid economic outcome in the years immediately following the epidemic was a rise in wages. Uh, in some industries where high mortality rates had significantly reduced the workforce, and that created a demand for able-bodied workers. Uh, moreover, indicators suggest that the economic effects of the pandemic were short term, uh, helped in part by continued wartime production and a robust post-war consumer demand. As we know, by the 1920s, the economy and stock markets were booming. Well, as my final uh, just uh, reference point, while businesses uh, and the economy recovered quickly from the 1918 uh, pandemic, Individuals' lives, of course, changed forever. Uh, for instance, one study conducted between 1960 and 1980 of men and women who were uh, exposed to the virus in utero, in other words, before they were born, uh, revealed that 15% were less likely to graduate high school. Others in the study experienced higher poverty rates and lower occupational status, with men's wages somewhere between 5 and 9% lower than average, suggesting that the long-term economic implications of the virus were felt for years after the disease had vanished from cities and stores and indeed from our memories. So thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. That was excellent. Um, our next presenter is uh, Kathy Creighton. Um, and Kathy has been the executive director of Butler County Historical Society since 2010. She is a native of the land of Lincoln and came to Ohio from Springfield, Illinois, having worked as a scheduler in the office of the governor and as an administrative assistant to the state veterinarian for 26 years. Uh, Kathy and her husband, Ed, live in an 1852 Ohio Historic Registered Farmhouse uh, where they raise, uh, and this is a fun fact, Morgan horses. So, uh, Kathy, um, if you can uh, take it from there. Thanks very much. Oh, uh, Kathy, I think you may be muted. Sorry. 
Okay, um, I just want to reiterate a little bit uh, back up and I'm going to talk about the history here in Butler County. Um, as our first speaker said, the origins technically were unknown. Uh, they first thought the disease came from China or Vietnam, but it looks like now it actually originated in Haskell County, Kansas in January of 1918, spread to Camp Funston, and then as he said, it was spread practically worldwide by the Doughboys in the United States. Uh, the second wave reaches the United States in the fall of uh, 1918, and it's going to reach Hamilton and Butler County by early October of 1918. There we go. Um, these are some of the rules that were developed by the American Red Cross for the influenza, but you, it's these were came out. Let me tell you that the influenza outbreak here in Butler County was less than one month. Basically, the second week of October through early November. But you can see that the uh, what they were saying, avoid crowds, stay home if you're sick. Um, uh, wash your wash out your nose and throat. Um, you should wear masks if you're working on people. And it was interesting that the division uh, of sanitation for the Navy Department also came up with some rules. And I love their first one. It says, "Protect yourself from infection. Keep well and do not get hysterical over the epidemic." Uh, they also said to avoid crowded streetcars, avoid trains. When possible, you should walk to work. Now, here in Butler County, uh, the population of Hamilton was about 39,000 people. And by October 5th, Mayor J.C. Smith closed all the schools and public buildings in Butler County or in, in Hamilton. By October 7th, there was at least 1,000 cases in Hamilton. Churches were closed by October 14th. They said that local doctors were working seven days a week for at least three weeks and averaging 100 house calls a day. Uh, Mercy Hospital uh, was one of only two hospitals in Butler County at the time of the epidemic. Uh, Mercy Hospital, this is a picture here of the back of it. It was full to capacity and they had to set up three tents in the back to take care of the overflow. The only other hospital in Butler County at the time was Middletown. The hospital had opened the year before. When they reached capacity, their overflow was set up in the Elks Temple in Middletown. Now, what was done specifically here in Butler County? Schools were closed twice, once in October and once in December of 1918. Miami University was closed, churches were closed, Meetings were canceled, movie theaters closed, any building for re used for receptions was closed, churches and lodges were forbidden to open, and Halloween was canceled, and all store Santas were uh, taken care of, no store Santas in 1918. Did they have shortages? Yes, it's interesting. The only shortage I could find was Vicks Vapo Rub that was a shortage during the 1918 flood, or I'm sorry, the 1918 flu. Um, funerals in Butler County were limited to family members only 15 minutes. The caskets had to be closed or they had to have glass over the face of the deceased. No church services. Bodies were piling up because there was a shortage of coffins and grave divers, diggers. Greenwood Cemetery couldn't get enough graves dug, so they had to borrow the inmates from the county jail to assist with the grave diggers. So let's just take a look at some of the statistics from Butler County. Now, when we're looking at these, I'm going to say that Spanish influenza did not become a reportable disease in the United States until October 10th, 1918. That's almost one week already into the outbreak here in Butler County. Um, and so a lot of the cases were not reported. A lot of the cases, as you read the articles, were reported as pneumonia because pneumonia was a contributing uh, a cause of death with the Spanish influenza. So you see in October, there was 1,435 cases in Hamilton, 163 deaths, November 42 deaths, total for 1918, uh, 24, 79 cases, 264 deaths. Middletown uh, in October, there were 74 deaths. Their total was over 100 deaths in 1918. Miami University, you can see total 340 cases, 30 plus of them were uh, among the nurses in attendance. 
I want to make a notation at this point that one thing they learned from this was that Miami University needed to come up with a student health care service on the campus. And this was one of the things that led to uh, the importance of getting a hospital in Oxford because there was not one during the uh, pandemic. In the county, uh, we only figures I could find was seven deaths in Fairfield, one Hanover Township, three in Ross Township, six in St. Clair Township. There was no estimate for the total loss in Butler County. And again, like I said, this was because it was not a reportable disease at the time. Uh, 34 military deaths, soldiers that were part of Butler County's troops, uh, they were also died. So just briefly for Dayton and Cincinnati, they're estimating 40 to 50,000 cases in Dayton, which was roughly one third of the population. In Cincinnati, they said there was up to 1,000 infection with nearly 1,800 deaths. And I'm gonna stop on this little note. In Cincinnati, they had a big discussion as to whether they should close the bars and the saloons. They were not closed in Cincinnati for the 1918 pandemic. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. And uh, it's just fascinating to see those uh, parallels. So uh, our fourth speaker uh, is Ian Mackenzie Thurley, who has been the executive director of the Fitton Center for Creative Arts here in Hamilton, Ohio, since 2015. Um, originally, he was from Sydney, Australia. Uh, Ian has a degree in music and postgraduate study in theater directing. Uh, he has worked in artistic programming and administrative roles in Australia, the United Kingdom, and the United States, including positions at the Sydney Opera House, the 2012 London Olympics Cultural Olympiad, and finally also as a producing artistic director. So, um, Ian, thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the invitation to speak here this evening. Obviously, I am not an historian. Um, I'm a theatre guy. I'm a production guy. Um, and I'm also in the midst of my very first pandemic. And as I say that, I'm here in quarantine uh, here for the next 14 days in my attic uh, with the virus very much hitting home and very close to home with my family right now. So uh, feeling it on all sides. Um, history has been important to me. Uh, looking over our shoulders is a really good way of seeing what's coming uh, and in fact, my first indications that things were getting quite serious uh, was, was looking at what's happening in Germany and Italy uh, in uh, late February into March with theatres closing. And that was a big sign for me. Uh, and I was able to reach out to some people um, here locally and internationally to see uh, how that was going to affect us in the future. And uh, their uh, prognostications were, were pretty spot on about where we might be. Um, obviously, this is a challenging time for the entire world, for Ohio, for the state, the United States, but uh, for the arts, it's been particularly challenging. Uh, when you close public spaces, uh, first the schools and very shortly after that uh, were the theaters. Uh, other things have reopened. Other places have been able to trade through this, uh, somewhat uh, reduced sometimes, uh, sometimes to full capacity. Uh, but most of the theaters on planet Earth right now are shut. Uh, completely. And we can talk a little bit in a little while about what we're going to do in the future, but for the best part of six months, we're shut down. Broadway is completely shut down. The Metropolitan Opera, one of the flagship companies of this country, is shut down till September of next year. Um, this is a challenging for any business uh, to be able to run when you're not working, uh, when you're not able to open your doors. Obviously, we're doing this right now. We can say that virtual is fantastic. We can reach you right from our living rooms to your living rooms. Uh, but that's not live theater. Um, we've had a boon, obviously, with online content, uh, with Netflix uh, and streaming, which is absolutely fantastic and a great way of artists to connect to the rest of the world. Uh, but we, in my, in my part of the world, live in the live market. And there is nothing quite like being in the room with your friends, uh, with your family and a live musician, a live actor. And there's been a reason that that has survived for thousands of years uh, well before a pandemic. Um, as part of my research early on, and this was in March in, into April, reading about the Spanish flu, one of the things I wanted to find out more about was what happened with theaters. When were they closed? How did they close? More importantly, how did they reopen? And I found that challenging. And so if we do have any historians out there, both on the panel or out listening, I'd like to know more because I've tried to find out. One of the interesting things that I did find out was the way it changed cinema 
or uh, cinema distribution throughout the United States. Uh, Hamilton, as you may know, was full of cinemas, uh, 10 to 12 of those at one time. That's, that's just cinemas, not the live theater here. Uh, but across America, there weren't chains of, of cinemas. There were mom and pop style independent cinemas. And of course, as they closed during the pandemic, because people weren't allowed to go in, uh, they were gobbled up uh, by Hollywood studios uh, and connected together. And it's changed how film distribution was set up uh, throughout the 20th century and now into the 21st century. And we're seeing that happen again. Uh, you're seeing a lot of cinemas here uh, throughout the United States and throughout the world with the big uh, blockbusters not being able to come out. Uh, they have not been able to put those into the cinemas. And there's a lot of money, not a lot of money to be made. And they're really, really challenged. And I certainly understand that from a live perspective. Um, as we go into the future, uh, we're trying to live with what we all call now the new normal, trying to live with this, uh, this pandemic and to go forward, obviously mask wearing, dis social distancing. And we've had some success. We've been working with our partners and we've been doing live theater outside. Uh, we've been doing screenings. We've been doing events outside and it's all been very successful. But this is Southwest Ohio and it's about to get cold outside uh, depending on the day. And we're looking at ways to move forward and how we can do that. Uh, but we are the arts. We are resilient. We're thoughtful. We're creative. Um, but it's also a massive challenge, uh, not only financially, but obviously artistically. And then, of course, we have our health to mind, not only of our patrons, but of our staff, our volunteers, uh, and, and of course, of our artists, uh, because we want to move forward. We know that the arts are important uh, to a community, uh, not less here in Hamilton, where they're very well looked after by the community, by the city, uh, and, and at large. And we really appreciate that. But we want to be in a position that when we can fully open, that we can be there. Uh, lots of challenges ahead, um, certain untimed, maybe not unprecedented ever, but certainly unprecedented in our times and a challenge for all greatly concerned. So we appreciate everybody's support and we look forward to seeing you supporting the arts and coming back to live art, we hope, very soon. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. And uh, I completely echo your sentiments has been challenging as well for uh public programs at, on on this campus um but uh our final presenter this evening is joshua smith um who has been city manager of hamilton ohio since september of 2010. Uh, before serving in hamilton he was a city manager in iowa and in wisconsin since 2001. he received his master of public administration MPA degree from Iowa State University with a concentration in public finance. Um, in addition, he's also received executive certificates from Harvard and MIT. So it's my pleasure to welcome Joshua Smith. Thank you, uh, Dr. Smith. I appreciate the, uh, the introduction. Uh, from my perspective as city manager, when looking at the response to the pandemic at a very local level for me what was instructive was when i started as uh, as city manager uh in my career it was in 2001 and it was uh, approximately five months before 9 11. and when 9 11 took place it was something that uh was unprecedented and in our United States and something it was unprecedented on how to react to it. So when the pandemic first began to take shape um, and you started watching the news cycles, the news threads and the 1918 Spanish flu was being talked about, uh, I went back and I, I did some research and as Kathy Creighton talked about earlier, what was the impact to our small business community in Hamilton uh, in Butler County? and almost immediately the headline started popping up um, across the United States, across the world about small businesses, owners that were giving up, small business owners that were discussing closure without some type of incentive to stay open. And for us in Hamilton, our success has been so fragile in my tenure as city manager. It was something that that I give the mayor and city council tremendous credit for. They They really focused on the small business community. Why? Well, first and foremost, I think they viewed the small business community as our sense of normalcy. Uh, they understood 
uh, what our health department was saying, what the Ohio Department of Health was saying, what the CDC was saying in terms of social distancing and of best practices. But they also understood that uh, the progress that we had made in Hamilton could literally evaporate overnight if we did not somehow balance the two. And since our small business community is truly considered the lifeblood of Hamilton, uh, we immediately went to action by creating a cross functional team of city of Hamilton Chamber of Commerce, TV Hamilton, uh, the Vision Commission, which is made up of senior executives across the spectrum in Hamilton, and really going to our local small businesses and saying, what can we do to help? I realize when government asks that question, most people get scared. Uh, we really wanted it to be something that was a positive for the, for the small businesses. And the feedback was tremendous. Uh, the first thing city council led with was a gift card stimulus program, and that received incredibly positive reviews. We worked through the Hamilton Economic Development Corporation, which is housed at the Hamilton Chamber of Commerce uh, with Dan Bates. Um, and very quickly, Dan assembled a small group to vet uh, an application uh, that we pushed out to the small businesses. And I, I'm very proud to say that our community pushed out a stimulus program before the state, before the federals, before anyone was doing it, and, and quickly helped stabilize many of the small businesses. The, the team that we talked about a few slides ago has been absolutely tremendous. Uh, Takeout Tuesday was quickly established. Uh, we had our first ever Hamilton Restaurant Week. Uh, we did 513 day where you pick five local shops and spent $13 uh, dollars at each. You could win certain prizes. Uh, we launched Amazon, which was our version of Amazon, which was a showcase of local products that um, as the restrictions grew in terms of putting people in the stores or how many people were allowed in stores or people, uh, our citizens general unease of being in a store with other people, uh, the online shopping really became very popular at, at a very local level. Uh, we've done many other things, including encouraging outdoor eating opportunities. Uh, we established an online Hamiltonian tip jar where you had a lot of um, frontline servers at restaurants, at bars, other places that were not getting the tips they normally received because people were ordering uh, more to go or delivery. Uh, so this was their opportunity to actually leave a tip online, which I've heard from many of our uh, different servers and bartenders across Hamilton that was really for them. It was a way for them to pay the rent. It was a way for them to keep their jobs. Uh, the Dora program for us has been incredibly successful. And it's something that uh, many other communities, uh, even though we, we certainly were not the first to have a designated outdoor refreshment area where you could buy um, a beer um, and be able to walk around the downtown with it. But many other cities across Ohio have, have asked us how our program has been so successful. The Hamilton Flea, which is a uh, in-person event, uh, has been uh, moved to a hybrid version uh, where we can do it also virtually. Uh, something has been very popular is as we've shifted to more uh, takeout dining, uh, the 10 minute max uh, curbside uh, parking, which our uh, brick and mortar restaurants have asked us to for, forget the pandemic. They wanted it done on a permanent basis. If you go up and down High Street or Main Street right now, You'll probably see about a dozen parking spaces uh, painted that very green color that you see on the screen right now uh, to make that easy for um, the businesses to uh, their patrons inside and outside quickly. Uh, we have several future projects that we're working on during the winter months, understanding that uh, that's going to be probably a very tough winter for bricks and mortar in terms of getting large crowds of people uh, inside restaurants. But um, really, the moral of the story for the city was how do we keep a sense of normalcy? How do we keep people um, happy with the progress that the city is making? And how do we come out of this? Because if if the lesson that I can take away from 9-11 was things that felt very different for a period of time, but when we came out of what I call the 9-11 funk, uh, when people started traveling again and eating out again and uh, being more normal again, at some point we know this will end and we want to come out of the gate running as quickly as possible. So really, this is a thank you to our small business community for hanging in there, uh, for being resilient. Um, the slide on the screen uh, we ripped out of the uh, online journal news today. 
uh, coronavirus not slowing Hamilton's growth and upbeat mood. And that really in a microcosm is what we wanted to capture coming out of this. Um, and anything that the city can do to rally around our small business community, we want to do it. And, you know, I, and obviously the city is not all knowing and we make plenty of mistakes, but the one thing that we are very focused on is getting real time information uh, from the small business community, because we truly believe as our small, uh, as our small businesses go, so goes our community. So with that shop local, and I also want to say thank you to our health department who has worked tremendous amount of hours and has uh, from, I know, at Ian at the Fitness Center to John Wilhelm at Helm at Hamilton High at the Miami Regionals has done a tremendous job of really uh, trying to push out good real time information, but doing their best to uh, give us that sense of normalcy following uh, obviously good practices. So with that, thank you very much. And I look forward to answering any questions during the Q&A. And thanks to all our panelists. It was good there to end, I think, on a, a note of resilience, um, which I think is something we're all hungry for these days. Um, I've been uh, just watching actually the uh, the Q&A chat uh, while this has been going on. We've already getting some uh, great questions. So with the time remaining, I'm going to try and get to everyone's questions. Um, so I will just try and uh, start off with Annika. Annika was the first uh, question we received this evening. Um, which is maybe a, maybe a prospect we don't want to consider, but uh, Annika asked, how would we deal with a pandemic if it were to happen again? And um, I guess, uh, Joshua, I know you've just spoken, but um, perhaps you'd be the, the best position to, to answer that question. Well, first and foremost, being through it one time certainly helps. And I think that we would use a very similar blueprint that we used the first time. Obviously, uh, through the health department, we would try to lead with the best practices because uh, the intent would be to keep his people safe as possible. But that being said, we would um, quickly rally around the small businesses. We would um, be better prepared in terms of PPE and things of that nature that uh, in terms of health department, public safety folks that were, were going to stockpile going into the future to make sure that we're better prepared from that perspective. But I feel, I feel, maybe I'm biased in this, but I feel like from our small community perspective that we have done a, a fairly good job of communicating and working with um, the different institutions and the different small businesses and, uh, you know, keep our fingers crossed that we don't have to deal with this for another 100 years. But if we do, I, I truly think that we're better prepared. Okay, I'm going to uh, keep it moving because we're getting a lot of questions, which is always great. Um, the next one, I think I'm going to ask uh, Jim, because I think it's something that he might have uh, a comment on. Was there a vaccine for the 1918 flu epidemic? Uh, and if so, how long did it take to develop? Sure. Um, so the 1918 flu epidemic did not have a vaccine. Um, we could not see viruses in 1918. We understood that the basic concept of a virus, they called them filter passing agents, something that was too small to see under contemporary microscopes. Um, indeed, it took another world war to get the flu vaccine. And the reason for that was that in 1918, often um, influenza was misdiagnosed. The previous pandemic of flu occurred in 1890. It spread out of Russia and a German physician named um, um, Richard Pfeiffer diagnosed a bacterium that he thought was the cause of influenza. And so doctors tried to treat that bacterium. Again, flu is a virus. Uh, we couldn't see the virus. That's where this mis misdiagnosis came from. But doctors were really focused on treating what they called Pfeiffer's bacillus. And it wasn't until it wasn't until the 1930s that we had an electron microscope that was powerful enough to see uh influenza and viruses and it was during the second world war um out of concern to keep um soldiers fit for combat that uh, american soldiers fighting in 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 the early years of the second world war were the first clinical trials for a flu vaccine it's fascinating uh and thanks to jack for that question that was a great historical question another great 
historical question here from uh, Cheryl Barringer. Um, and I'm just going to uh, maybe I leave this one open for the historians to answer. At the end of the Spanish flu, were there wild parties, celebrations, or permanent changes in behavior, or did everyone just try to get back to normal? So it's really important to bear in mind, at least I argue, um, it's really important to bear in mind the, the wartime context, which is why I keep going back to it. And so it's quite hard to disaggregate the sort of natural decline of influenza with the broader post-World War I recovery uh, process. Um, it, we achieved, and, and of course we're hearing this term a lot, um, herd immunity, uh, uh, by and large to this particular strain of influenza, enough people caught it um, that, that it, there was a degree of immunity. Um, so it's, it's quite hard to, to know, to see the recovery of flu as an, as an isolated phenomenon. So, so it's really quite hard to answer that question because obviously there is much transformation that occurs worldwide in the aftermath of the First World War. Um, Matthew, with that, uh, I've always found it interesting as I've gone back to look at this, um, the great documents of history, obviously, from where I am is art. And I'm struggling to find that great folk song, the the play that was written, uh, this, maybe the silent film, um, the uh, dedication in a, in, on a street or on a street corner to those lives lost, of which there were many in this country. Um, we sort of skipped over the pandemic. It's become very popular now. But we went through World War One, straight sort of then to the Great Depression, and then the Second World War, of which there is much said about and written about. But um, from an artistic point of view, we're just not seeing it. Um, it'll be interesting what happens this time round. But had that if those things had been viable and in front of us, maybe there might have been a greater reminder to us to have taken a little bit more care and a little bit more precaution uh, and better preparation as we headed into you know the future, or which for us is right now. Yeah, and. Uh... I guess anecdotally, it also goes along with the sense that people didn't want to revisit that episode of history. Um, I have a question here from uh, Fred Bottenstein. So hello, Fred. Um, uh, have you learned anything interesting about disparate effects on socioeconomic classes, races, and genders? I think this is a, a question which obviously has uh, connotations as well for the, the present present time where, where people have written about the uh, disparate effects of coronavirus on different populations. But I, I guess this is referring to the uh, to the flu of 1918. So it's an interesting question if we want to apply it specifically to, to 1918. Um, it's curiously, um, uh, again, ambiguous. But if we think in the, the broader picture of the history of, of pandemics and historical perspective, um, there are lots of lessons about how disease more broadly has impacted um, differences in economic classes, races, genders, et cetera. Um, if we just think about um, uh, uh, other 20th, I often talk, you know, in the beginning of my slides, I talked about the big four being plague, um, influenza, HIV, and COVID-19. Um, we see a lot of this in, in both a very deep past in the case of plague, but also in the more recent context of HIV AIDS, where stigma is imposed on different um, demographics in different ways, obviously. Um, um, uh, for example, if we if we think way back to the Black Death, um, um, Jews were stigmatized as bringers of a, the wrath of a vengeful God. It is what the perception of the plague was, having no understanding of of, of pathogens. Um, obviously, in the 1980s, um, the four H's were stigmatized uh, in response to HIV. Um, that, that's homosexuals. Hemophiliacs, uh, Haitians, and um, um, intravenous drug users. I can't remember what the H stands for in that case, uh, but there's tremendous stigma uh, in HIV's original misnomer, very cruel misnomer, of course, was, was GRID, gay related immune deficiency disease. And so 
pandemics affect different bodies in 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 lots of of different and often negative ways. I want to just add a little bit that um, when we were doing our research on World War One, we found that the newspapers were very bad, and I'm going to be politically incorrect at this point of what they talked about color uh, covering the colored troops going into World War One. But it was interesting when I was doing the research on uh, the Spanish flu that they were reporting uh, both deaths in, in all of the different uh, uh, areas, be it Hispanic, be it white, be it African American. Um, but another thing we have to look at is back in 1918, they weren't keeping the type of statistics that we are now. Um, so to try to find information to make a correlation to what it was, I don't think they were keeping those type of statistics. At least I know they weren't here that I could find in Butler County. That's great. We have another question here on the uh, Spanish flu. Was there a coordinated federal response to the flu outbreak in 1918, 1919? And did the outbreak uh, or response, federal response, become politicized? So that's really two questions. But was there a federal response, and did it become politicized? I'll, I'll jump in on that one, and then um, just to get a little bit. Um, no, there was no coordinated uh, federal response, and uh, Dr. Harris alluded to that, and I, I think I alluded to that in my um, comments as well. In that. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, who was president at the time, um, privileged his uh, interests in uh, supporting World War I, uh, both from an economic standpoint and a readiness standpoint. And when it came time to make the decision about, you know, uh, what are we going to say with regard to the flu? How are we going to address the issue? He chose instead to focus on World War I. So you don't get a coordinated federal level response. You get a lot of, again, hodgepodge at the state municipal level. Um, and then when it comes to the mask wearing, again, no coordinated federal response. Um, and it, you know, it wasn't as politicized. I mean, there were, you're going to have pushback uh, among different groups on the mask issue, for sure. There were um, aggressive people who were openly hostile to wearing masks in 1918 and pushed back on that. But, it, you know, the, the responses that came at the local level and even at the state level, you don't see the, the kind of the divisiveness that, you, you know, maybe we're seeing today in the same way. And it's really... Yeah, if you, go, if you go back into history too and look at what's going on in 1918, the US government did not consider it an epidemic when it was come out. Um, and so there was no na uh, national guidelines. If you saw with the slide that I had up, the American Red Cross came up with their guidelines in November of 1918, which is well past the worst part of the pandemic. Um, it's also interesting to note that Woodrow Wilson also came down with Spanish influenza when he was at the Versailles Peace Treaty uh, conference. And again, they kept a lot of this information secret from the American people. So you, you do see a lot of parallels with what is going on if you look along this line. Okay, that's good. That's great. Um, I'm going to move on because we do have uh, a lot of Questions. I'm not sure that we're going to be able to get to all of our questions. Um, this panel is scheduled till eight o'clock, so um, I think I, I will ask the panelists if if we can just stay for a few few extra minutes, um, just to address some of these questions. Um, and I think you also, uh, Susan, just earlier, uh, kind of answered the question: Was it the same pushback to masks? And safety measures in 1918 as there is today. Uh, Nathan Trailer asks, do you feel COVID-19 will have the same results of death rate as the flu did in 1918? Um, I think I'll ask that one to, to Jim. Do I think the death rate will be the same? Sorry, I was going to send someone to the, the, send, give some more anti-mask questions in the chat. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, could you just the questions about the death rate? 
Yes. So I think the, the question is, uh, would it be the same as, as the flu in 1918? Well, uh, in March, I would have told you uh, we doubt it. Um, the um, death, we know deaths lag behind cases um, in terms of um, um, metrics today. And the curve is, is going the wrong direction. And as of yesterday in the United States, there were 225,215 deaths. That's about a third of the number of deaths as occurred uh, that occurred in 1918 in the United States. I really, really, really don't hope we don't achieve that 675,000 deaths number, but we're definitely going in a disturbing direction. Yep. And I guess it's also important to point out that uh, the population of the United States is much larger today than it was, obviously, 100 years ago. Um, next question is uh, actually a, a student from Miami University, Sophie Mather, um, thinking about how xenophobia and anti-Asian discrimination have shown up with the current pandemic. Um, Sophie was wondering how xenophobia might have been present in the pandemic in 1918. So that's, I think, a good question. Obviously, uh, we had a, a world war around that time as well. Um, Jim, I know you, World War One is something that uh, you may, may be able to speak to. Or maybe one of the other. So I'm not sure what happened with Jim. Uh, oh, okay. So, so I'll just Sorry. I'll jump in. Uh, that's okay. Um, you know, it's interesting because of World War One. You see xenophobia. You know, clearly around Germans and German Americans in connection with the war effort. And I'll be frank, though, I didn't see. And and you know, Jim probably has a better answer for this than I do. Uh, I didn't see it uh, attached uh, xenophobia attached to the Spanish influenza in the same way. Um, I think, uh, although by naming it Spanish influenza, there certainly is, you know, kind of on the surface of, of it, um, a sense of that. But, uh, you know, um, you, you don't see a lot of people attacking Spaniards in the United States at this time, because indeed the focus is largely on World War I. And if you're going to be hostile, then it was largely directed at Germans and German Americans at that time. And, and Jim might have a different answer, though. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I had a little bit of lag there. Um, there, there's some really strange, um, in, I wouldn't say this was, you know, a mass perception, but in, in terms of researching the pandemic, I've seen some things that perceive this as a, as some kind of a biological weapon, an impact of, 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 of mustard gas usage. Um, yeah, I think the point about the naming it, the Spanish flu, um, was a blame game that both sides of the war could play, right? Because again, Spain was neutral. And so uh, neither side was then the the cause. It was just something that happened in between them. And and so that's something I like to dispel when I talk to audiences, like don't call it the Spanish flu, because that's, that's a misnomer that really only creates this xenophobia. Um, um, but generally, yes, there's there's not substantial xenophobia that emerges. OK, and uh, I apologize if I referred just a second ago to the Spanish flu. Um, so uh, good question here from uh, Martha. I don't know if, if uh, we can point to anything concrete. What safeguards were taken in 1918 in the US that we aren't doing now? In other words, what, what were we doing right in 100 years ago that we're not doing today? Acting faster. Um, those same public health strategies, um, this is why I ended my segment with talking about social distancing and masks. You know, this is what the CDC is recommending for us to be to be doing, but it was it was enacted in um, this is what I think is really interesting when comparing Britain to the United States. Um, the British were much slower to to enact these kind of policies. They waited till the war was over. It wasn't until November, if we think about the trajectory of the course, that schools, the discussion of school closings and cinema closings uh, occurred, whereas this was quick. 
uh, you know, weeks, weeks, a month uh, time, as opposed to several months uh, that these actions were taken in the United States. And, and the key to containing any pandemic is, be it 1918 flu, be it COVID-19, is, is box it in. Box it in, contain it, kill it. And that, that requires quick and decisive action. So hearing what the city of Hamilton did sounds like um, um, more about the recovery side, but it sounds like the quick decisive action um, is, is exactly what can and should be done. Excellent. Um, I, I want to apologize if I'm skipping over anyone's questions here, um, but I think George uh, Paraskos has a very good question which I'm going to direct to the uh, city of Hamilton in the form of Joshua Smith. Uh, what business opportunities, uh, parenthesis, manufacturing, medical, other, are possible for the Hamilton area as a result of this challenge? I'm not sure if I can point to anything specific that came out of this. I will say uh, from a deal flow perspective that our deal flow has not stopped or slowed down since the pandemic. 80 acres um, has continued to uh, build and grow. Uh, we've announced uh, SECA, which is a large corrugated uh, boxing company out of Spain. Uh, we're currently dealing with a very uh, another very large uh, manufacturing prospect. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can't, there's not a corollary there between uh, COVID and um, an opportunity in my mind with respect to manufacturing. Besides, it's just interesting to note that we have not slowed down at all in terms of economic development. Thanks very much. Um, we have we have some very good questions here, so I, I do apologize once again if, if I miss out uh, any, anyone. Um, I'm just scrolling through them because I'm aware we've just passed the, the eight o'clock mark. So I think we might just have time for uh, two more questions. So I, I will um, apologize again if, if uh, anyone has been uh, skipped over or, or missed out. Um, question here again from, from Jack. And uh, oh, yes, uh, Jack asks, what positives have resulted from the struggle with this pandemic? Um, so I don't know positives in what field, but uh, can anyone, would anyone care to, to answer the, the question, what positives have res resulted from the struggle with this pandemic? I, I can start just very quickly from a very local perspective that it's been my observation that uh, in Hamilton that, that people have rallied around different businesses. They've rallied around um, decency. Uh, it's not that people were not decent before. I, I, I feel there's a heightened sense of pride and decency that is more on public display than what I saw maybe in past years. And that certainly to me is a positive takeaway during this uh, difficult time. That's I'd absolutely, I'd absolutely echo that, that the uh, community coming together, being able to support each other um, and that uh, and a real focus there on, you know, buying local, looking after local um, for if you don't, you won't have the opportunity um, and you've got people who've been working hard. It's one thing to not provide a service or not have a level of customer care um, that a business may go out of business, um, but people are working very hard um, getting that support, not only from, you know, the city or from from the federal government being so uh, as, as as part of that of our community to going out there and to support local because we want to see them continue to grow and be part of our community as we're going forward. And that's been great to see across the board. Absolutely. Um, question here from Susan, and then I think we might have one more. Um, Susan writes that she knows from research she did in grad school a few years ago. She has a few years in in uh, quotation marks. Um, one of the things that uh, they did in Dayton was uh, open the schools on the 11th of the 11th, 1918, which, of course, was the end of the First World War, um, just long enough to celebrate and then shut the schools down later in the afternoon. Did anyone find that this happened anywhere else? Any of you in your uh, historical research? 
schools opening to celebrate the end of the First World War? <laughs> um, so I'll jump in and say that, you know, Armistice is what the date there is. And, you know, there were, you know, in numerous, uh, you know, celebrations across the country. Some, you know, resulted in massive spread of, of the, um, the flu. Um, and I, I guarantee you there were schools that probably did open uh, around the country to celebrate the end of the war. It was a significant event, obviously, uh, and then closed again. And there, there are, you know, I think Kathy alluded to the fact that, you know, in Hamilton, they closed the schools and open it and close. And there's uh, a sense of that uh, in, in my reading through some of the historical record where you see um, school districts opening and then uh, realizing that, you know, they needed to shut again or reopen again. I'm not sure how many of them were attached specifically to Armistice Day, but I'm, I'm certain that there were probably some who followed suit. In Columbus, the schools closed. Uh, I'm just checking my dates here. Um, uh, October 13th of, of 1918. And then I don't know if they reopened to celebrate, but they more broadly schools were closed through the end of the calendar year. And of course, they didn't have uh, the option of, of Zoom. Or, uh, or, or uh, online classes at that time. Um, I'm going to finish off. Uh, we have one last question, um, which I think is a nice one here from uh, Casey Bowman, um, which kind of goes back to the question of uh, xenophobia. Um, but how did the Spanish feel about the 1918 flu being called the Spanish flu? I'm guessing it wasn't called the Spanish flu in Spain, but I may be wrong. Um, it's similar to some someone in the US calling the coronavirus, the Chinese virus. Um, is there any is there any uh, evidence that you found of of uh, responses in Spain to to the uh, use of this term? I've seen no responses as to what what uh, they said. But the reason they called it the Spanish flu was that most of the cases and most of the coverage was coming from Spain. And most of what the world was knowing about this influenza was because Spain was putting the information in their newsletters or in their newspapers and in their reports. Uh, the United States was not covering it at all. The United States did not consider it an epidemic. Uh, so the Wilson administration was ignoring it. Um, I don't think the Spanish people, I've never seen anything from a Spanish newspaper, which you don't read Spanish, said anything, but it was only called the Spanish flu because they were the ones covering it. To give you some statistics to just follow, could build on what Kathy just said, um, uh, about eight million Spaniards uh, died of of the Spanish flu. The King of Spain himself uh, caught the disease, and and but but it, in terms of was it used pejoratively? I'm I'm not sure either. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, um, we have we have some more questions. Unfortunately, I, I think we're at time. So um, certainly, I, I just want to thank our panelists this evening uh, for sharing a range of perspectives, um, different perspectives, but I think perspectives which uh, help to shed light on the situation that we are in the world today uh, with with the coronavirus pandemic and how that compares to particularly the, the Spanish flu of 100 years ago. Um, so again, my name is Matthew Smith. Um, I am uh, the director of the Michael J. Colligan History Project. Um, our panelists today have been, uh, I think we'll still be uh, quite happy to answer any questions if you want to um, get in touch either with myself or my colleague, uh, Kelly Hayes. Um, I want to thank everyone for attending this evening. Um, and I also want to uh, just hope that you all stay well, and um, I hope we can meet again uh, and under better circumstances. Hopefully, we, we can all uh, look forward to a time when, when we get a lid on this uh, pandemic. But uh, once again, thanks very much to all five of our panelists this evening. I think it's been a, a very stimulating conversation, and thanks also to uh, the audience this evening, our virtual audience, and. Take care, keep well, and uh, stay in touch.
Thanks, everyone.